everything This Dispatch, I'm hurt pretty bad. The suspect fired eight shots at this police officer in seconds, leaving him mortally wounded with three gunshot wounds. You're not going to want to miss this special content, special edition of Profiling Evil. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Profiling Evil. I'm Mike King, and today I'm sitting with Quincy Smith, a patrol officer working out of Estill, South Carolina. Now, this 32-year-old cop faced a horrid situation back on New Year's Day in 2016, and we're going to talk a little bit about his case. But first, I want to just say to you, hit that like and subscribe button and make sure that you're ringing the bell so you get all of the notifications on our stories. Now, Quincy... You have been a busy guy since then, not only going through recovery, but getting back in the saddle as a cop and probably dealing with all the emotion of all of this thing. Why don't you just tell everybody a little bit about you before policing, why you got into policing, and then let's talk about your uh, your event. So, um, like you said, my name is Quincy Smith. Um, I'm actually a former officer at Esto. I work for Matthews Police Department in North Carolina now. Ah, Congratulations. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I transferred back in 2020, just before the hit of COVID, actually, you know. So, um, yeah, <laughs> as soon as I started working there, that's when COVID hit and, you know, <laughs> a lot of things. What, so so let me yeah. ask, how, what's the difference in the PDs? Because Estel's a pretty small PD. Well, I would say this as far as, yeah, the staff quantity we have, uh, we just got approved to hire uh, uh, five to six more officers. So here, the total staffing for officers here is at least 68 to 70 officers. That's awesome. Uh, total versus Esto, who were staffed for 12, you know, for the entire town. So that is a, a major difference. You get to do everything in an agency that size. You get to work detectives. You get to work patrol. You get administrative duties. Um, what do they got you doing right now? So I'm actually the traffic officer here. I'm on the traffic unit. <laughs> <laughs> I've always loved traffic, even when I was in Esto, you know, even though we were small, but, you know, that seemed to be my niche, traffic enforcement. <laughs> so uh, take me back in time to what life was growing up for, uh, what, what it was like for you growing up, uh, because I think you got a really cool background and a mom who uh, maybe influenced you a little bit. Yeah, so um, um, I, I, like I, said, I grew up in Hampton, South Carolina. Um, which is 10 miles from Esto, so um, it's in the uh, county of Hampton. You know, I grew up in Hampton City, though. So um, I, um, I was pretty I was pretty well off, you know. Um, graduated high school um, at Wade Hampton High School. And I, uh, after graduating high school, my mom, you know, she said, hey, you know, you got two choices. You're going to the military or you're going to college. Pick one. <laughs> so I, ch- I chose the college route. And, you know, she said, hey, there's some pretty good schools up in at the time. She lived in New Jersey and worked as a New York City police officer. So and um, she and she, she retired, York, right? New Jersey. She retired yeah, she's from retired. She's NYPD, still a cop, though. She's I, I decided to I applied to some college in, in New Jersey and in New York, and I got accepted into this one college, Kane University, you know, which I actually played football for for a little bit. Did you? Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, what I position did, did you play? Well, thank you. Running back, running back. Oh, that's yep. awesome. Yeah, so um, uh, went to college up there, and uh, on some days when I didn't have class or anything, I'd just go over to New York and visit her on her lunch break, and, you know, we'll walk around, and she'll answer or respond to some calls while I'm while I'm with her, but, I, you know, I wouldn't go close because New York is different. They, they're dangerous over there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, I'll just observe from a distance how she worked and operated, and, you know, and uh, I was like, you know what? You know, I, I kind of like what, how she interacted with people and stuff like that. And you know, my uncle on my father's side, he was a a, 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 a lieutenant for the police department down there in, in a town next to my hometown. So I used to go see him and hang out with him. And you know, it kind of just pushed me towards law enforcement as well as my mom's sisters. They were dispatchers at some point in time. And I was like, you know, it pretty much, it was in my blood, you know, to become a law enforcement officer. So I was just surrounded by law enforcement in some type of way. You uh, get into college and then you end up 
signing up and getting hired and you went to the academy. A lot of people don't understand how how uh, tough the academy can be. Why don't you tell a little bit about what your academy experience was? Well, first things first, I don't know how anyone else academy is ran, but South Carolina Academy is pretty different. The first thing, uh, you know, when I first got there, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but the inmates are the ones that fix our food and clean up around the campus. The trustees, yes. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, so you're doing for us and we put you here. I know you're mad at us. (laughs) Like, you're doing something to our food. (laughs) So... But now, um, you know, but the inmates, they, they were cool, though. The ones, like I said, they were trustees. So they say trustees. I don't know if they can be trusted now. But, um, but yeah, um, we get there. You know, you wake up uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, go do formation, and you, you exercise, and you raise the flag. Then you go eat breakfast. And like I said, the inmates fix your food. They greet you, they greet you at the cafeteria. <laughs> You know, um, and then, you know, they fix food, you sit down and eat, you got a certain amount of time to eat, and then you got to get back in formation and then get ready for class, you know, depending on what you have going on that day, whether it's driving or, you know, defensive tactics or, you know, firearms training, and then you got, you know, your legals, um, classwork and all that type of stuff, so, um, and don't mess up and don't leave your room junky. You better have your bed made and everything before you do all that, before you even go to class. So, you know, if not, you can be doing some push ups, sit ups, jumper jacks, anything you name it, or running. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's very tough and it, it is extremely stressful, you know. And, they, and, and, you know, I see why they people put you up under this stress because, you know, there is, is a piece of cake versus actually getting on the road, honestly. You know, once you once you leave there and actually get on the road to start working, it's a total different element. You know, um, they want they, they put you under stress to let you know, hey, this is the type of stuff you can deal with, you know, outside of here. So we want to make sure you're ready. So um, like I said, they put you on a great deal of stress and everything. So make sure you're ready and mentally stable to handle what's to come when you actually get out there in the real world and start, you know, policing and you know, stuff like that. So, you know, it's interesting because when I finally retired and pulled the pin, I mean, I'd, I'd been there long enough. I'm thinking of your mom retiring from NYPD just in the paper in the last couple of days, NYPD is lowering the physical standard because they can't get cops to take the job. And in a while, you're going to talk about how a physical standard saved your life, I think. And, and I, I guess I'm really troubled by the fact that we're lowering a standard just to put a pair of pants inside of a patrol car if they're not physically ready. Because you cannot explain to anybody out there that hasn't been in a fight for their life what it's like to have some guy trying to get a hold of your gun or being in a fist fight. And you're the, you're the last line of defense. What are your thoughts there? Oh, definitely. Uh I- I definitely think you need to be in some type of good physical shape um, because, like I said, um, I believe part of the reason why, you know, I survived was, you know, because of my physical health at the time, you know. Now, I didn't work out every day and, you know, um, but I had a good physical uh, stability that I, I was able to, you know, do certain things. You know, I, wouldn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't getting tired just that quick off of doing certain things. You know, um, but uh, over time, I would say, like I said, this job, it will cause you to gain weight and be, get slack and stuff like that, because especially if you work night shift for one, and then depending on where you work, where I worked at, there was nothing for one, there's nothing healthy to eat around there unless you fix your own food and meal prep Two, you know, you're working overnight. So you're going to be snacking on things just to try to stay up. And once you get off work, you know, after dealing with everybody else's problems, you got to come home and you got to sleep and you won't sleep half the day until you get ready for your for your shift again. If you're not off, you know, um, I don't think as far as physical, you know, you should if you if you want to get in law enforcement, you got to have a mindset, man. You got to have a certain mindset and you definitely need to be trained and well fit to get into this job because it, it can 
take a toll on you. It's gonna it is it's not can, it's going to take a toll on you. Especially if you've been doing it for 30 plus years, you're you're gonna have some health problems getting into it. Let me ask you this. You get through the academy, you finish your field training program, and you're now out on the street. What year and month is it when you're finally out on your own? Um, I was a I was already a cop for two years as a campus police officer for the University of South Carolina. Uh, it, it wasn't a, a field training program. You know, I did ride with a veteran officer who's already been there. For, mostly for them, they just needed me to learn where I'm at, the streets that I'm on and stuff like that. And I already know how to do the basic police work. You're, you're now out on the road. How many how many months or years had you been at Estill? Uh, before New Year's Day in 2016? Uh, six months. Six months six on months. the job there. So um, yeah. let, let's take everybody back. And, and what I'd like you to do is just paint a picture of what the call for service was. And then if you don't mind, I'd like to play the video up until the, the uh, moment before the shooting occurs and then have you talk about the mindset an officer goes through uh, when they have to make those decisions of lethal versus less less lethal. What was going on in your mind? But but kind of paint a picture first of what the call for service was that came across. So pretty much the call for service was a guy snatching groceries from another person at a grocery store or the liquor store. Pretty much someone's trying to take a bottle of liquor from someone at the liquor store. And um, so when the call came out you know um my whole mindset for that day you know it was new year's day and about esto it's it's an extremely small town and when i say extremely small it's less than three square miles big like we only have one traffic light like seriously you go through you're in and you're out literally at 30 miles an hour you in and you out so um the amount of officers we had at the time was seven officers for the entire town. So one officer works during the day and two officers work at night. And during the daytime, Monday through Friday, you know, um, the chief and the assistant chief are in the office and they are that, that, that road officers back up pretty much, you know, they come out as needed, you know, but they're handling administrative stuff for the most part. So this call comes in and it's actually, uh, I mean, if he's taking it from a person, it's a robbery at that point, but was there any force? What was the, what was going on? And for people that are watching, I mean, this is a big significant difference. A robbery becomes a felony. That's a a higher standard than a theft of taking somebody's uh, package sitting on the park bench. You're taking it physically from somebody. Talk about what, what was, what information you had coming into you. So, um, my dispatch they called and they called me over the radio and they said hey um respond to um the uh uh bobop's convenience store um the party shop that's what it actually called the liquor store is right next to the convenience store um the response to the party shop is uh there's a black male with a camouflage hunting suit on and a red bandana snatching a bottle of liquor well snack they say snatching groceries from people so in my mind at the time, I'm like, for it didn't sound right. I was like, I'm thinking, I'm thinking myself armed robbery. Like, you mean armed robbery? So I asked my dispatch, I say, what was he doing again? Because it just didn't sound right. You snatching groceries. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't sound right. And they she confirmed it. She said, be advised, the caller stated he was trying to snatch groceries from another person. So I'm like, okay, this is about to be a simple call. They're at the party shop, which is the liquor store. They're probably drunk. And they, they probably just want some more alcohol or something like that. So, and it's New Year's Day. So I'm just going to go over there, talk to him, you know, see what his deal is, talk to the victim and get an understanding. And mostly I'm, I'm going to try to just send him home if I can, you know, so um, unless and see if the business want a trespass notice, if that's, you know, how the route I can take, you know, I, it was New Year's Day, like I said. So I wasn't trying to ruin anybody's, you know, New Year's or anything like that. So um, um, that's pretty much my mindset on that was, you know, um, after dispatch confirmed that it wasn't anything as serious as armed robbery. 
Well, you know, and that's, I think you pointed out something really important here, Quincy, and that that people need to recognize is that cops aren't looking or driving around with a chip on their shoulder looking to make somebody's day bad. I mean, oh, yeah. oh, definitely, definitely. And I, I would say, like, you know, most of the time, um, especially when I'm, when I'm on patrol and stuff like that, like, I'm not intensely trying to find somebody to take to jail or stuff like that, you know. Now, if I see some things that catch my eye, I'm going to investigate and I'm going to do what I need to do as necessary, you know. Um, especially, you know, we have pe- a lot of people that complain in the community say, hey, we're having this going, we're having that going on, okay. My job is to thwart that. Hey, take that and stop doing what you're doing. We're not doing that here, you know. So um, I try to I try to educate as much as I can, but some most of the time my hands are tied because of the situation, you know, that, you know, that's going on, you know. So in the community, they expect us and they want us to take care of that. They want it, they want certain things to stop in their community. So um the call came in. So um I was on the, the north side of town, even, even though it's not that big, but I was on the north side of town. And um I, I head down to that direction and um I get to location, I see I don't see anybody in the front of the store. So I circled around to the back and I see the gentleman they described, you know, standing off into the, in a wooded area behind the business talking with another person. So, you know, I, to confirm that was the guy, I uh, go inside the store um, to confirm with the caller that he was the person that they pointed out. So I get out of my patrol car, I walk in the store and the lady, she runs up to me. I didn't even ask no questions yet. She said, hey, the, the, he tried to snatch that man's bottle of liquor and the man jumped in the car and left. And he's standing over there up under the tree right there. And I said, okay, yeah, I see him. So I would uh, say, okay, I'm going to go talk to him. Um, so with that information, you know, like I said, it just, it just, it sounded like he was drunk and just wanted some, wanted some more alcohol to party or whatever he did, whatever he wanted for. And, you know, I, I was just going to talk to him. That, and I realized the victim left. So I really didn't have a crime because the victim left. Only thing that I had was maybe a trespass notice if the business wanted him trespassed. So I said, OK, let me go talk to him, get his side of the story. And so I leave out of the store and I get back in my patrol car and drive over to the area where he was. And I get I get to the area, I cut my blue lights on. And when I pull up, he, he actually starts walking away or whatever, like nothing happened. So I get outside of my car and I ask him, I say, hey, man, you know, come over here and talk to me for a second. And like every like everyone do in Esto, they just walk away from me and ignore you like they didn't hear you. Like you're not around. They didn't hear you. They didn't do anything. They're just walking away. So um, I give him multiple commands, to, you know, stop and come talk to me. And like he can just continue doing what he was doing, just walking away like nothing happened casually. So I then start going, walking after him to try to get him to stop. And um, I'm still giving him multiple commands to stop. Now, I will say this, you know, be- just before I got out of the car, you know, I'm going to pause real quick. Um, I got to bring this point up. Just before I got out of the car, um, I, you know, like you said earlier, some things, you know, go through an officer's head about how, you know, they're going to proceed. Um, one of the first things that I thought about was the way the call came out. And I was like, okay, so he came out as him snatching groceries and stuff like that. And when I get to him, he's walking away. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, it's not armed robbery, so this is nothing I need to draw my weapon on or whatever. So I'm like, okay. All right. And then another thing that popped in my head you know, um, just a couple months prior to that, an officer shot a man in the back in North Charleston, South Carolina, and it it was really bad. You know? And for whatever reason, that popped in my head, and I was like, uh, "Well, I don't really want to be the next person to uh, draw my weapon and shoot somebody intentionally or accidentally in the back because they're walking away because a call came out." So I was like, "You know what? You know, I'm just going to try to, you know." Um, de-escalate him into stopping and talk to me, you know, versus me trying to get physical with him or anything like that. So, like I said, I, I continue to give him uh, verbal commands to stop and stuff like that, and I notice his hands in his pocket.
dispatch Echo 7. I'll be out with that subject. Come here, man. Come here for a second. Come here if you don't. You better stop or I would. Come here. Come here. Stop. I'm not. I'm stop. Stop. Take your hands out your pocket. Take your hands out your pocket. And I was uncomfortable with that, you know, but I didn't, I wasn't thinking, you know, um, in my mind that, hey, this is, could be, this could be bad. You know, I'm, I'm not thinking that, hey, he could possibly have a gun or some type of weapon that he can use against me. I'm, all I'm thinking is that I'm going to get him to stop. I'm going to get his name, you know, run it, make sure he don't have no warrants or anything. Talk to the business owner, see if you want to trespass. If not, I'm going to send him home, He, you know, or if so, I'm going to send him home, tell him, hey, you can't come back to the business. So while I'm in the process of doing that and trying to get him to stop, uh, I, I noticed his hands in his pocket, and he still wouldn't follow any of my commands, and I kept closing that distance on him. And when I got close enough, he pulled the gun out of his jacket pocket and shot at me eight times and hit me three times. First shot hit me in the neck. And it happened so fast, um, um, matter of fact, prior that I got a little hit. So um, I actually drew my taser, and I told him to stop. If you don't stop, I'm going to tase you. And like I said, he still didn't uh, listen to anything I said. And then when I closed the distance on him and got close enough to him, um, I, I warned him one more time, and he pulled the gun out and shot at me eight times and hit me three times. First shot hit me in the neck. Well, and we're going to pause right here because uh, I'm going to run that video and we're going to we're going to see how much time that takes. And then I, I'll add that in with just a number up at the top of the screen of how many seconds for that uh, gun battle to last, because I think it is uh, remarkable for people. You'll hear people say, how on earth could they have shot 28 rounds in a in a gun battle between a suspect and a police officer? And uh, it it can happen in seconds. If you don't stop, I'm gonna tase you. I'm a, I'm not playing you. Take your hands out your pocket. Take your hands out your pocket. Take your hands out your pocket. Shoot for you. I, um, he pulled the gun out and shot at me eight times. It hit me three times. Now, I never saw a weapon. I just heard the bang and I felt the pressure on my neck from the first from the first from the first shot. The first shot I heard and I felt the pressure on my neck. Now, and I, it was it, it was enough force to push me to the ground. So um, I realized I, I knew I had gotten shot. But, you know, um, so I was like, you know what? I need I, Thinking fast, I need to get up, get some cover, and pull my weapon out and return fire. So um, I get myself up off the ground, and I run back towards my patrol car because that was the only cover that I had because he drew me away from that. And I'm running back towards my patrol car, and I'm trying to call my dispatch from my radio. My, my lapel mic sits up on my left shoulder. So I'm trying to reach with my left hand, and... I, I, my left hand felt funny while I was running back towards my patrol car. And while I was running, I kind of glanced down really quickly. And I noticed um, um, half of my arm when I was lifting up was pointing towards the ground and the other half was pointing towards the sky. And I, I immediately, yeah, I immediately started panicking while I was still running back towards my patrol car. And like I said, all this is a matter in seconds of me running. And so I'm still running and I'm yelling shots fired and I'm trying to reach with my right arm to tell my dispatch what's happening. Well, unfortunately, the bullet that hit me in the neck damaged all the nerves in my right arm and I couldn't even use that either. I couldn't lift it up. So in essence, it felt like I was running with no arms. So um, I'm, I'm still panicking. Yeah, I'm still panicking. I'm still running, you know, trying to call my dispatch and use my arms and stuff and yelling shots fired all at the same time. And. I'm still, nobody's hearing me, but if anybody's outside listening. So, um, but I was able to get back towards my patrol car. And 
what I was able to do, I was able to take my right arm, use my body weight to like throw my arm up under the door handle and use my body weight to open the door. And then I was able to throw my arm over the emergency button in my police vehicle and use that to call my dispatch and tell them what was going on. Training makes all the decisions for you when things go south and when it gets bad. Your mind doesn't think, I'm going to go push the button. It's the training before that that says, I've got to get to that button that led to that. But I mean, yeah, what... In all yeah. honesty, it, like, honestly, my mind wasn't even thinking about pushing the orange button. It was just a natural instinct. You know, I threw my arm up on an emergency button, pushed it, grabbed my radio, and tell dispatch, hey, shots fired, I'm hit, I'm hit, shots fired. It, it's just a natural reaction. Like you said, the training, they they beat it into us. Now, I will say this, though. Nobody actually ever, say, you know, trained us in, you know, we do this, push the button. We do this, push the button. No, nobody actually did that. It's just, you know, from, you know, um, in-service training from here and there, you know, not actually beating into our head, push the orange button or whatever. But it's instinctively, we I know, hey, the orange button means emergency. When you push that, everybody... In the county, everybody in surrounding counties, they're going to know, they're going to hear it, and they're going to come. So that's that's the only thing I can tell you based off the in-service training and how they teach you how to use the radio and stuff like that. You know, um, not like other training, like defensive tactics that they'll beat in your head like, hey, this, 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 you know, you know, but you you still know certain things. You know? So you're making, and, you're and making people, this radio call and you're maintaining – situational awareness with this suspect. I, um, I mean, give people a sense of what's going on in your mind without any, without any cognitive thinking, really. You're not really deciding, I got to look and see where the suspect is. It's all just part of what that training has done over the, the course of your career. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, oh, after, after he shot at me, um, I, at some point I thought he was chasing me. You know, back to my car because I still, I still, even when I was running, I still kept hearing the shooting. You know, and I didn't have any use of my arms. Only thing I can do at, at, that I'm thinking about, hey, just call for help so somebody can know something. This is what's going on. I know I couldn't get my service weapon out because my arm was in incapacitated. So, um, like, like I said, uh, the only thing I can, I was thinking about now is getting help to me or getting someone to me into the area immediately. You know, because my honestly, my closest backup was ten miles away. That's that's my closest backup. So yeah, I was the only officer for at least ten miles. Um, and could you can so, you uh, uh, point out where you were shot in the neck? So I was shot right here. So the bullet it entered right here in my neck and took a downward path into the right. It missed my major. My, it missed my major arteries. By millimeters, the doctor said, but it cut the vein that was right next to it. And uh, he said, he said, fortunately, unfortunately, he, you know, he had people with that wound have died, you know, but for whatever reason, my vein that hit, that it hit, it clotted and it kept me from bleeding out and it stopped the bleeding. And uh, that that's and when I got to the emergency room and when they started operating on me, that's when the vein burst open and started filling with blood. Well, um, I, I would suspect that you're a man of faith and that oh, yes, there are lots of, lots of explanations people can give, uh, but we, we know yes, from whom those blessings flow. So that's, that's uh, um, amazing. So you now are in your patrol car, you've summoned help, but your help is, I would say a good six or seven minutes away if they're 10 miles away. So yeah. what, what's going on during that period of time? Because all of a sudden, it gets pretty lonely, doesn't it? Yeah, units dispatch, or any of the units dispatch, respond, stop station, stop station. Fire, gunshot, fire, subject, head on north, the officer, suspect. Dispatch, Echo 7, I'm hit. I'm hit. I'm hitting my neck someplace. My arms are broken. Help me, please. Wait, all units 10-3, all units 10-3. <clears throat> all units 
Go ahead, dispatch. And is everything too full? Dispatch, I'm hurt pretty bad. Oh, we got help on the way. Is the subject still there? Touch it, take off. Please help me, dispatch. Um, I, when, I, when I first started, you know, um, calling for help and stuff like that, I had, a, I had like a, a flashback. And it took me back to my college days when I was in my senior seminar class. What popped in my head when I was, uh, this project I was working on is called, it called People's Perception of Police. And for my research, what I did was I had, to, I collected a collage of videos off of YouTube and it was good thing police did, bad things police did, and dangerous things we encounter. I would show that, I would uh, get people's, perception from a survey before watching the video and after watching those collage of videos and one of those videos that i downloaded it it, it, it popped in my head it was a flashback and it was a trooper out of tyler texas and he stopped a vehicle and he ended up finding uh drugs and alcohol and stuff like that and um he pretty much what it was when he tried to arrest the driver um, the, the passenger opened the door, distracted him, and the, they end up shooting him multiple times in the face, neck, and chest area. And he survived, though, but for whatever reason, that video popped in my head, and something told me, he said, hey, Quincy, slow your heart rate down. Control your breathing. I can't tell you, I cannot tell you to this day, but the man above, why I did that and how I did that. Something in me told me to do that, and I started doing it, focusing on my breathing and my heart rate, lowering my heart rate, make sure, you know, my uh, blood level was not elevated and started focusing, okay, where's the subject at? He's not here. He's took off into the wooded area last from what I saw. So that that was the only thing that I can tell you what I've, what I, that I've done. That was, I was going through my head at that time when I was sitting in the car. And at some point, you know, I did realize I was like, man, I got shot in the neck. I'm not going to make it out of here. So I, I dispatched. I told my dispatch, and I told him, I said, hey, tell my family that I love them. Dispatch, please tell my family I love them. Because I, 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 I wanted them to know that, you know, I was thinking of them in my last moments. And you know, the other thing that's incredible to me, Quincy, is you didn't have a body camera but you did have something that I hope you got a lifetime supply of. And if not, I'm going to help you get it. Why don't you explain to people why we even have this video that we're looking at? Cause it's, that's a remarkable okay. story in and of itself. <laughs> so, yeah. So um, as I explained earlier, my police agency is really small. We had a total of seven officers, you know, and of course we don't have the budget to, you know, for them to supply us with body cameras and stuff like that. Um, so, um, you know, when I first got to Esto, my chief, he, uh, my deputy, he was a deputy chief at the time, Mark Collins. Uh, he, uh, sat down with me, say, Hey Smith, you a young guy, you know, I just want you to let you know, you know, you don't, you've been in this, uh, long, this, uh, career for two years and you even worked on a college campus, man. So I'm pretty sure you already know. So just be careful what you say and do out here, you know, cause people, especially women will come. And they will lie and say certain things just to get out of a ticket or a, a charge or whatever. And I was like, well, chief, you ain't got to worry about that. I'm not here for that. Like, you know, like you and you're right. I did. I worked on a college campus. It's extra sensitive over there, you know, versus here. So you ain't got to worry about that. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to get my own body camera just so I can have that extra eye and confirm what I, you know, my statement. So I went on Amazon. And I was looking up body cameras and I saw the traditional ones that we wear today. 
and they were like six, seven hundred dollars. I'm like, I can't afford that. I mean, I work in a, a small town in South Carolina, only making like twenty nine, thirty thousand dollars. You know, so I'm like, I can't afford that. So I, I really just kept looking, and I came across some glasses that had a camera on them, and it was they were like uh two uh like so the first pair that I purchased they were like uh I think it was, they were like uh like seventy dollars and they had a camera centered in the center of it and said high quality sound and high definition video so I see and they look like they look like Oakley glasses they look like normal glasses you would never tell so I said you know what I'm just gonna try these out see how they so I ordered them and they came in the mail and then I opened up charged them up and went and did a few traffic stops with them and i came back to the office looked at the video I'm, i was just amazed i'm like oh wow this is this is excellent right here like oh i'm definitely so i went to, i went and told my chief media i said hey listen i ordered these you know because we didn't have a policy on body cameras we didn't have any so i said i ordered these i feel like this can help me out when in traffic cases or any situation where somebody might come and complain on me you know and he tell me, hey, well, I don't have no problem with them. That's fine. He saw the videos. Like, they're good. I don't have no problem with that. Like, okay, cool. So I started weighing them during my traffic stops. And when I go on the calls and stuff like that, and lo and behold, I catch capture my own shooting incident on them. So you capture your own shooting. And it actually, um, I, I want to come back to this in a minute, but let, let's get through. You go through this really dark moment. And I mean, if you were writing a movie script, this is that dark moment yeah. where you are thinking, you know what, it's over, and I'm going to let my family know I love them, and uh, and thankfully you had the sense to slow down your breathing and to get a hold of yourself, but eventually help comes. And uh, how long is it until the suspect's arrested? Uh, after that whole, I think it was two hours after that, because uh, uh, he was. Yeah, they got them pretty quickly. Um, we had amazing support from agencies all over, man. There were agencies out of Georgia that came as far as Georgia and three and four hours away just to come help after the hearing about it. So, you know, like I said, Esso is a small town, less than three square miles. And from what I was told, they had at least 100, 100 to 150 officers in that small of a town looking for a person. So it, it was inevitable that he was going to get caught. So how long how long did the recovery take? And give people a sense of the number of surgeries and what the totality of the injuries were that you suffered. This was a nine millimeter that the oh. suspect was shooting. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so he shot me with a nine millimeter ballpoint around. Um, if I would have got shot with a hollow point or anything bigger, I probably wouldn't have made it. it really yeah, and let, let's take a second. Bigger. That's really important. Explain to people why that was life saving because that ball point is going to pierce through your body, but it's not going to do the damage mm -hmm. that a hollow point would do. Maybe you could explain that uh, a little yeah. differently. Yeah, because a hollow point it mushrooms and it peels back, and it uh, I guess you could I don't know the exact term, but it I guess shrapnels it breaks apart and tears everything that around it and the fact that the uh bullet hit my uh it missed my artery by millimeters and not damage it versus a hollow point if the, if we would have penetrated with a hollow point it would have clipped that major artery or if not severed that major artery because of how it peels back it would have clipped it and i would have bled out it honestly in seconds on the road i wouldn't even be able to run back to my patrol car so um but so yeah, now you're so on the road the, um, to recovery what were the injuries and tell everyone about what your recovery was like so the injury all right so the injuries were um the my neck wound um i also got shot in the arm um this is on my surgery marks here and there i got a both side. i had metal rods placed in my arm this actually is the uh, bullet wound i believe it's the entry wound and on this side is the exit wound and it shattered it shattered my forearm and that's when i was telling you i say half of my arm was pointing towards the ground and half was pointing towards the sky so it, it severed it severed this uh forearm right here and i didn't have no use of that i still use my muscles but as far as lifting it up i had no control of where it the angle or anything um i actually got hit in the hip too 
but I, another thing blessings from god the bullet that hit me in the hip it hit my magazine holster that hold my duty rounds that stopped it from penetrating to my hip so i was blessed with that yes now the bullet that hit me in the neck like i said it took a downward path and to the right and it stopped just it, they say it stopped under my shoulder armpit but it i guess at some point in time i guess when i was moving it shifted towards my back and it's it was it stopped finally completely up under um up under my shoulder blade just underneath the skin you can see it protruding outside of my skin when i was at the hospital they said they took it they took that took that bullet out later on in the week or whatever but um so yeah so i had ex severe nerve damage on my nerves on my right side on my upper torso right side so and for my recovery it took a year and 10 months for me to recover from everything to be back at least close to 100 percent. I, I don't think i ever be 100 percent, but it I, I it took a year and 10 months for me to get close to recovery for for that physically and um i had multiple surgeries on my left arm where i had with a bullet shattered my bone my and had to do a lot of therapy uh physical therapy it was extremely painful you know going to physical therapy some days it's like i don't want to deal with this it is like i don't want to feel like being in pain i'm comfortable you know but i knew i needed to get it done you know so i can be back to where i was because i was determined to come back to work i was determined to come back to work i didn't want them nobody to say hey all you got to do is shoot a, shoot an officer and he'll quit no that that wasn't me i'm i'm hard-headed <laughs> I'm too. I, I was too determined to be, to go back to law enforcement. I only been in this thing for two years, and that was my most desire was to be a police officer. You know, after seeing my mom and stuff like. So that. So you yeah. you end up in court. Uh, how long before the trial happens? And just let everybody know what happened to this predator. Okay, so um, it took a, a year later before he actually went to trial. Went to trial in August two thousand seventeen, and um. So we went to trial lasted for three days. Um, the defense attorney uh, argued that, and, and I kid you no joke, that I provoked him to shoot me. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. So he 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 argued that and that oh I had my taser pointed at his head and this and that whatever he can argue is is like no. I was like no, like I investigated a crime. You know, and when I try to get him to stop, regardless of any, regardless of anything, you know, he did not have the right to shoot me. I was trying to talk to him. He didn't have the right to shoot me. I wasn't no danger to him until he presented himself as a danger, you know. So um, after I testify and they play the video and the testimony from everyone, even the slate agent, the investigator, everything. Um, the jury deliberated for 45 minutes and found it and convicted him for attempted murder and possession uh, of a firearm during the commission of a violent crime and got he got 35 years total 30 years for attempted murder and five years for the possession of a firearm so the gun enhancement and when when is he eligible for parole uh actually i'm not sure but i know when he's eligible for parole is going to be around when he's like 60 close to 60 Do and have you ever had any like 20 have you ever had any conversation with him since no i've never met him i've never seen him before do you still have dreams do you still have uh, moments where the memory races back how, how are you dealing with life no no listen brother i gotta tell you i have been extremely blessed you know, in the initial process of the recovery, I've had dreams. I've had fears of going back to work and stuff like that, you know. But um, I, I speak about this all the time. I even go to some police academies and I, I actually have a whole PowerPoint set up that I, you know, speak about it, you know. Um, even I've talked to therapists and stuff where it was required before I even came back to work and stuff like that. So, and uh, honestly, no, seriously, uh, uh, honestly, they said, I've handled it better than they've ever seen somebody experiencing what I experienced. I haven't had any, I can't even tell you the last time I even had a dream. I, 
I don't, I can't, I, it's probably might be bad to say, but I, I don't even dream. I don't know the last time I even had a dream. I sleep good. I sleep ex. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm so God glad has to been hear blessing that, me with, No, seriously, seriously. Um, maybe one time I maybe had a bad dream and it was like years ago, but I can't tell you when the last time I've had a bad dream or even a dream period. I just sleep peacefully. <laughs> awesome. So um, yeah. what advice do you have for the rookie officer after your experiences thus far in your career? So um, when I go speak about my incident to the police academies and stuff like that, you know, the one thing that I told them that that day was I was extremely complacent. You know, I got the same speech when I was in academy. Complacency, don't don't do don't get complacent. Don't get complacent. So I brought I was a lot. I was extremely complacent. Then once I started working there for a period of time, I got used to how people were acting, you know, so I'm like, okay, you know, once I you know, physically put hand when I'm trying to investigate and stop somebody for whatever, once I grab their arm or their shoulder or, you know, if things get serious enough, threaten them with the taser, you know, they're going to stop and they're going to want to talk to you. They don't want any of that stuff to happen. I got used to that. And when I did that, when, during my incident, I was expecting that. I didn't think of anything else. I was expecting him to stop at any moment now and talk to me. And he never did, and I just kept getting in that stage that what it the term that they use in the academy is oodle loop, you know, that that same repetitive thing. I, I, I just kept going that same repetitive thing. He's gonna stop, he's gonna stop. But he, he never did. He was planning his attack. So the thing was, I t- tell him, said, listen, listen to your training, and please, whatever you do, that complacency is real. Complacency will get you killed. You know, I'm not saying you got to go out there and be gun ho and draw your weapon on everybody. No, but look at when when you when you're dealing with certain situations, you know, approach everything as if, you know, someone is going to harm you until you can deescalate and get everything under the control where you can control it. Okay, I didn't have control of my situation. You know, he had control because he drew me out from my cover. He didn't listen to any of my commands. You know, how I approached him, he he brought everything to him how he wanted it. And it aligned for him. It didn't align for me, you know. Now, granted, I didn't have the resources like the HC I'm working at now where I had backup. I was the only officer for 10 miles, you know. So it's it's pros and cons to that, you know. It's all about, you know, the uh, phrase everybody say, pick your battles. You know, now, regardless, I had to go investigate because someone called and it was a crime that happened. So I had to go investigate. But maybe if I would have called for assistance from the sheriff department based on what happened after I noticed something, you know, maybe if I would have if, if he didn't stop, get back in my patrol car, keep a distance, follow him, keep an eye on him, you know, call for assistance, wait for somebody to get here and, you know, keep a track of his location until I got back up something, you know. Uh, but like I said. It all depends on the resources you got, man. So if I could tell you anything, the, the biggest thing was for me was complacency. I was extremely complacent, and I don't want nobody to fall into that. That is really good counsel. I I really appreciate you taking time to talk about this today. You know. Oh, yeah, de- definitely, man. You know, I would say my connection to God has really gotten stronger ever since that incident. You know, um, I'm... I, even up here, you know, um, in my new agency, they always ask me, Quincy, the man, like every time I see, like you're always happy. I was like, listen, and they asked me, say, is it because of what you experienced or something like that? I'm like, well, well, for one, I was always an energetic, happy person, but I would say, yeah, that that takes that that did a lot for me, man. You know, because you know, why be mad all the time? Now, don't get me wrong, I have my days where I can get mad, and I do get mad at situations, you know, but I try not to let that drive me and to have it ruin anything for me for the most part i am a happy person man like you you can't be going around being mad and disgruntled man because life is short you know i i honestly i never expected to even get inside get into a shooting with anybody or getting shot alone you know um i always thought you know um that i'm just gonna have this fun energetic career man i get to Drive high speeds, catch the criminal, and take him to jail. And that's it. <laughs> I ain't gonna be in no danger until it actually happened to me. And it, 
it opened my eyes a lot. You know, I got to sit in, you know, during my recovery time, I got to sit and think a lot about how I can be a better person, how I can be, you know, a better officer and, you know, just, you know, what am I giving to people? You know, I try to be respectful and I try to be, you know, treat somebody like I want to be treated if I was on the other end, you know, you know, it's been situations before I was a cop, I've encountered, you know, officers and some officers, they weren't really nice. And I'm like, why are you being so agitated for? Like, I didn't do anything wrong to you. Like, why are you mad? You know, uh, I'm talking to you with respect and stuff like that. And you just have this nasty attitude towards me. You know, and I was like, you know, I don't want to be that officer, man. You know, oh, I'm going to give you respect first. And then if 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 so, I'm going to control the situation. Now, if you start to get, you know, agitated, I'm, I have to make sure this situation is controlled, you know, based off of my situation for one and, you know, and my safety, you know. Well, Quincy, thank you. And folks, we have had the privilege of listening to Officer Quincy Smith talk about a traumatic experience in his life. But most importantly, I think the messaging that we got at the end of the day is how you can rise above bad things in life. And Quincy, I I wish you the very best as you continue through your career. I hope you'll let me know as you get promoted through the ranks. But uh, you got (laughs) to let me know. And folks, all of you out there, uh, make sure that you're weighing in down below because Quincy's going to be reading the comments. Let him know how you feel about things. And, uh, and make sure you're hitting that like and subscribe button. From all of us at Profiling Evil, Quincy, I want to say thanks. And to everybody out there that supports us, hang in there. Good things are happening. Things are getting better. And uh, hopefully this tide has turned and, and the support is coming back to law enforcement and protecting our communities. So thank you. We'll see you all soon at the next crime scene.